Packers legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, 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 my friend, to the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Brad Wilson. And today's very special guest is the author of Modern Poker Theory, Building an Unbeatable Strategy Based on GTO Principles, Michael Acevedo. If you're unaware of the poker world's reception to modern poker theory, Let me catch you up. Michael's book has ignited a fire under the elite minds in our game, is already being referred to as the modern poker Bible, and has been called the best poker book ever written by Brandon Adams. What may have slipped under your radar is that there was a very real chance not all that long ago that Michael's career as a poker player was anything but certain. His path to game-changing author was a much more winding route than his contemporaries, and as you'll soon find out, it wasn't because of a lack of natural talent. After crushing his bankroll and falling short time and time again, Michael's poker career ultimately hinged on swallowing his pride, moving back in with his mom, who did not approve of her brilliant son being a poker player, for many good reasons, and once and for all, devoting every single aspect of his being to genuinely chasing poker greatness. In our conversation, you're also going to learn how Michael believes a beloved childhood toy laid the foundation for his future poker success, who gave Michael the last chance he so desperately desired in his final push to be a successful poker player, what Michael believes held him back from achieving a poker greatness for so long, and much, much more. And before we dive into the meat of this interview, I just want to take a second to let you know today's episode is brought to you by Poker with Presence. If you want to get in the zone and play your best when you need it the most, visit pokerwithpresence.com. Now, without any further ado, I bring to you an amazing story that will make you feel all the things. He's a wizard, coach, and author, Michael Acevedo. Michael, how are you doing, my friend? Welcome to the show. Uh, Hello. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Uh, Something that I've been wanting to do for a while now, and we finally got the opportunity to jump into it. You were excited to come on the show. Why, why were you excited to come on the show? Yeah, I actually wanted to talk to you. Um, uh, I've been, um, you know, everything that happened with the, the poker um, goat contest, all of that was very exciting for me. So I wanted to talk to you about that and you know, how you come out with some of those ideas <laughs> and what is coming up in the next and in the future for that it was very, very interesting. Yeah, I can't. I don't know that I could spoil the next iteration of the hashtag poker goat because I haven't settled on one thing yet. It was very controversial there at the end. I did not expect that for a tournament with no cash prize. Um, That was very unexpected with me having to deal with that. Yeah, and and neither uh, did I. um, You know, for me, it was just a fun contest. I actually think... um, I probably didn't uh, took it as seriously as I put it should have because I, then I saw what, you know, everybody was like very, uh, um, so much into it. Yeah, I feel like maybe I missed an opportunity to uh, promote my book a little bit more and, you know, maybe win the I know, 11 votes that <laughs> made the difference between uh, modern poker theory and, um, damn it, I forgot. Um, elements of poker, elements I of, Elements of poker, yeah, and elements of poker that I lost against my kind of love's book. Yeah, and, and so it, it seems like, uh, you know, his book is, is great and a lot of people loves it. And yeah, I didn't realize. So just I started promoting mine when I saw that, you know, we, we were like a few hours left um, 
in the competition and it was a coin flip 50 50 i was like holy moly <laughs> uh, i might lose this one um and we're getting close to the finals so maybe uh, i should start you know just uh, doing some social media posts or something and but that's pretty much all i did and then i, I you know i heard all the rumors everything that happened i was like what man this, <laughs> this is silly like it shouldn't happen yeah it was just kind of silly how it how it how it all ended but I do think it was a great competition. Um, a lot of people who maybe were not familiar with, you know, specifically elements of poker because it's been out for quite a while now. I feel like Tommy probably sold a lot of books and it got a fair amount of pu- publicity and was way more popular than I really thought it would be. I have to give the credit for the idea though to Poker Logia because he saw that I ran the Poker Goat tournament earlier on this year with players trying to find the greatest poker player of all time. And he's like, hey, we write up a lot of books. What do you think about running the competition with authors and books? And I was like, that's a pretty damn good idea. Let's do it. So he was, he was the inspiration. I actually drug my feet a few weeks before I, I started it because it's quite a lot of work. Logging on at the same time every day, po- <laughs> making sure that you post it and updating the graphics and just keeping control of everything and dealing with the, the blowback of people getting pissed off that their book is against a book that shouldn't be a, against, or it's in a category that they wish that it wasn't in the right category. Uh, <laughs> it's like emotionally, it takes an emotional toll, right? So I'm yeah. happy right now that it's over and that I don't have to deal <laughs> with it for, you know, a few months at least. Yeah. To be, to be, to be honest, um, I never ex- really expected to win uh, because uh, I'm not that well known and my book's been out there only for, you know, uh, maybe a year or so. So I didn't ever expect it to win. I was um, actually like 100% sure from the start of the competition that the biggest bluff was going to win the whole thing because, um, you know, that book's so popular and people seem to like it very much. So I, I, I knew that, you know, if somehow I make it, I made it to the finals, I was already expecting to you know, to, to lose to, to Maria Konnikova's uh, book. So, but uh, that's, uh, it is, it's still fun, you know, just to see the competition and, and when you see your book that is moving forward in the, you know, in the ranks and winning some contests, you're like, well, holy moly, this might, you know, um, get to the finals or something. So you start to get excited. But yeah, man, uh, at the end of the day, it's just a, a Twitter competition. Like, come on, it's no real price value on it, you know? Like, it, it wouldn't even give you, like, lifetime bragging rights or anything like it's just it's a tour competition so why would you you know um try to tamper with it or something you're just supposed to have fun of us and i yeah a a student of mine told me that it's very likely that other people place the importance on it even more than me right like i think of it as just a competition but then they're very emotionally invested so they likely are taking it more serious than even I was taking it. And I actually had to reflect and, and be like, okay, like maybe I should take this seriously. Like it, this obviously means a lot to people and um, it's, it's beyond just a little game now, but segueing back, I want to, I want to jump back to your story and you said okay. you're not very well known in the world of poker. So let's rectify that a little bit. Let's uh, start this conversation out. Obviously, after what we've already started out uh, with (laughs) telling my listener your story of where did you grow up? How did you get involved with playing cards? What does your story in the world of poker look like? Uh, Yeah, well, I've always loved games. Um, Every since while I was very little, I started with, you know, video games. How old are you? Then (laughs) I'm actually older than people might think. I'm 33 now. Okay, I just wanted to just wanted to kind of get the timeline down. Thirty three. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm thirty three. So, um, you know, I grew up in the eighties with the you know old um, Nintendos stuff like that. And I was I I started off playing a lot of uh, Lego, you know, building things. With uh, I, I always liked that. Then um, when I was in high school, I learned chess, and it it captivated me. Uh, I became I learned it in ninth grade of high school. And I became. Um, um, can, we, can we go back just yeah. one second? Yeah, Tell sure. me about Legos, and yeah. because that was a thing that you obviously feel strong enough to mention it. So I want to ask you about Legos. What appealed to you as a kid about building Lego structures? I think uh, they are amazing to help you uh, model, model or uh, I don't know uh, make some 
uh, synapses and brain connections that will never help you in life. I don't have kids of my own, but if I had any, I will 100% give them something that they can use to build stuff and actually learn how to think. I think a lot of kids nowadays, they just, you know, they're giving this, you know, a, a, an iPad or something like that, that just does everything for them. And that kind of stifles, uh, you know, the learning process that you need when you're building or, you know, um, decomposing stuff in your own, uh, by, your, by, by yourself. Yeah. Interesting. It's, yeah. I think it definitely makes different. It made a difference for me. Uh, I actually think if I didn't play Legos at all, um, my brain would have developed completely different than the way it did. And uh, maybe it wouldn't be playing poker or anything like this would have ever happened. So <laughs> it's fascinating. It's fascinating that you say that because I also played with a ton of Legos growing up as a kid. And I've never really made that connection or even thought about it. But that was why it kind of stood out to me that because I, like you said, we grew up in the 80s, right? It's not like there was a ton to do all the time. So Legos and just figuring out stuff to build was a, a huge way to stay entertained and spend your time as a kid with no internet and no iPad. And like the best thing is a Game Boy, right? Like Exactly. And you know, the, the Legos that I had were just, you know, these um, bricks. I, they, didn't, they weren't as complex as they are nowadays where you have all these different moving parts and they give you like the structure, instructions so you can build it, you know, step by step. Uh, all I had was like, you know, this picture of a dinosaur in the, in the box. And I had to figure out, you know, how it was built and just look at the picture and then build it, you know, from the pieces, you know, just from, the, from these uh, um, square pieces. And it's crazy how that helps you, you know, just force your brain because you really want to have the dinosaur that is, you know, printed in the, in the, in the box, <laughs> in, the, in the picture. Mm-hmm. And you want to have it. And you know you have the pieces. So you need to figure it out by yourself because my, well, the, the ones I had, they didn't have the instructions how to build the staff. So uh, that really helped me, I think. Um, yeah, something that really suits up uh, for me. I wish I learned chess when I was um, younger because I love chess. I'm a big chess fan, but I, I don't play. I just, you know, I follow the tournaments, I follow the top players, and I see to, I, I love to watch the games, but I don't play myself because it sucks. <laughs> um, but I, I learned when I was back in high school and ninth grade, and then I became the high school champion ninth, 10th, and 11th grade, so three years in a row until I graduated. graduated. Then um, by the end of high school, I learned this other game called Magic the Gathering, which I think many other poker players have had experience with. And Magic is an amazing game as well. You have to build a deck of cards with a strategy. And, uh, you know, this strategy has to fit in a meta game where you are going to be competing against other players with strategies. And it's so complex as well, you know. So all of this, you know, jumping from, you know, Legos, then chess, and then Building, 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 exactly. I was also uh, always very good at math. I um, went to college to study physics. Um, you know, I was going to become an astronaut, actually. And uh, my mother almost had a heart attack when I told her I was um, quitting college in my last year before, you know, becoming a physicist to, to pursue a career as a professional poker player. <laughs> I can imagine that was not a fun conversation. How did that go down? Oh, man. Um, yeah, she absolutely hated poker. And it's crazy because she hated it. Uh, she thought that I was just throwing my life away, <laughs> literally. How did, you, and, how, how did you make that decision to drop out of school? I mean, I, that had to be a hard decision to make and a yeah. very tough conversation to have. Mm-hmm. It was tough. Um, I was... Um, uh, couple semesters away from you know finishing bachelor's degree uh but i had already um tried other stuff like i i love dogs as well i used to have um um i used to breed dogs i had bull terriers so well actually the story is a bit more complex than that when i was 18 years old i, I was kick off my my home <laughs> my, my mother uh you know um and i had an what'd you do Man, I just, I was just a teenager, you know, I, I, had, I had hormones and I started going out because, okay, when I was in high school, I was very well behaved, right? Uh, my mother was very strict, so I was not really allowed to go to parties, drinking, anything. I just behaved very well in high school. But then when I got to college, university, first year, I started dating a new girl and, you know, they would, she would just take me to bars 
and then I will start getting late to home and stuff like that. But I was still like, you know, like not doing anything like super wrong. Just, you know, normal stuff that teenagers start doing. I, I love how you, you put it on her. She was taking you to bars. You had no... Yeah, I had no <laughs> clue, man. I, I was a kid. I was 100% a kid. She was like the same age I was. But, but more worldly. Been, yeah, she had been going out since she was like 14. I don't know. So she had like four years. She was like four <laughs> years ahead of me going to bars and stuff like that. So. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that changed. So my, my mother, she took me away uh, of my home. and. Wow. Yeah, I had like no job, no money, no friends. And uh, I barely met this girl like two weeks ago. So, um, where'd you live when you got kicked out? I actually uh, contacted um, um, this, this guy from uh, one of the Magic Gathering card stores in, in, in a mall where I used to go and play because we got along very well. And he always told me that I was like a, like a, a son for him or something. <laughs> So I told him that, I, you know, my mother just kicked me uh, off uh, my home and I had nowhere to go. So in his house, he had this kind of uh, uh, massage room because his wife was a, a massage therapist and uh, they, she had like, um, I don't know, um, a salon where she would like, you know, yeah, do the nails and dress and hair and stuff for, you know, people, stuff like that. So I, I, I slept in, in this um massage uh bed for uh, in like a week or a couple of weeks then i got a job at the mall and then uh my new girlfriend uh she got me a room at one of his her uncle's uh, place i i i think my salary was 300 dollars a month for you know that's what i was making 300 dollars a month and the the room was i think it was 40 dollars a month so it was, yeah, like one third of my salary was for the room. But man, this room was the worst, like the worst <laughs> neighborhood. You know, uh, I will go, step out of my, uh, the, the, this house and there will be, you know, people doing crack. Where did you the, live? Where did you grow up? What country? Uh, Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Yeah, okay. Costa Rica. Yeah. So uh, I was like always middle class. Uh, you know, my, my mother always, she always worked very hard for us. But then, you know, I, I moved to this horrible neighborhood where, you know, um, you'll see like crimes happening all the time and, you know, you know, crack addicts just sleeping in the doorstep and the house was horrible, filled with rats and cockroaches and, you know, and all sorts of, you know, nasty stuff. Any and, regrets about going to the bars <laughs> at that <laughs> point in time? You, you know what? Um, no, not at all, because I think that only made me tougher, um, you know, just figuring out, you know, needing to uh, feed myself, uh, you know, paying my bills getting my stuff, getting my shit together. Suddenly I need to, needed to become a grown up man. You know, I was, I was a child. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, well, I kept going to university. I was just, you know, finding jobs, doing stuff like that. Uh, then I get a, a better job at a computer store. Then I, um, I tried to build my own empire of uh, selling um, copies of, game of video games like uh, you know there is a big market in you know in costa rica where well black market the, black market for video yeah you know back in the day people wouldn't pay full price for a video game they would just you know copy the dvd and sell it you know in, in, in the store so i i got this um machine that will allow me to you know do the copies and i started selling the copies to the stores in the mall i was always hustling was always doing stuff like that then I ended up getting a job at um, call center. I learned English by myself, actually, just by playing magic. <laughs> wow. It's crazy because, yeah, the cards were, uh, were in English. So the English you're getting in Costa Rica high school or the school is, like, super basic. Like, they give you just, like, the uh, ABC and, you know, the numbers, some shit like that. So I learned pretty much English playing magic. And then I got uh, a, a job at a call center. So that helped me improve my, uh, you know, conversational skills, all of that. And yeah, so by the time I, I found poker, it was because I was playing magic and some magic friends invited me to this Colombian guy who actually took me later on a house to play a poker tournament. They explained me the rules uh, on the same day I played, I paid $10 entry. And I made, I think, I, I finished second and I won a uh, hundred bucks. So I was like, holy shit, this <laughs> <laughs> new job. 
yeah, this this might be some might be something, and just you know, of course, uh, beginner's luck because I had no clue what whatever I was doing. I just finished second. Then I, I start I started doing going to casinos, and I I went um, I was want to play a tournament one day with friends, and the tournament was canceled, so we went to a different casino, and we get we get to this room we filled with it's a, like a very dark place, you know, you filled with uh, this old um american guys and these not so friendly looking guys you know <laughs> they they're like from, uh, smoking cigarettes they have like this whiskey you know in, in, the, in the ta- at the table and there's one one seat available and like i'm gonna sit there and play with these guys we're playing i think i want to and uh, no limit and or s- limit no limit and i said with 100 bucks or 50 buying 50 big things and my friends were like, you, you crazy? You really, you really want to play with those guys? I'm like, oh, why not? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think those um, 100 bucks was everything I had. Uh, and, and then I just started with them. I just, you know, was trying to you know, test my luck, see, see how I do it. And, and I ended up winning $300 that Monday. So I went back next Monday and I won another 300 I was like, oh my God, this is so good. So I was trying to get dogs because I wanted to become a, a dog breeder uh, of these bull terriers. And the dog that I wanted to get um, will cost me $5,000. I wanted to buy the dog from an Argentinian guy. And so sending the dog over from Argentina to Costa Rica was $1,500. Back then there was no Facebook, no nothing. I just contacted the guy using Messenger or something like that. I th- I'm unlucky. He didn't scam me at the end. But. Yeah, this is like, oh, you're paying 5K for an Argentinian dog from some <laughs> random dude on the internet. Like, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm so fucking messed up. But, um, and the worst thing is that, okay, actually, then I, I was like, okay, um, I, I think I can make this money playing poker. So I took all my summer vacations. And all I did was to go and play cash games to try to get the money for the dog. And I ended up getting the money, but it took me a bit longer than I expected to. So I had already sent the, uh, the Argentinian guy like uh, half the money, I think. So when I had the other half, I contacted him and I was, he was like, you know what? Um, I, I got bad, bad news for you. I went on vacation. I came back and, my, and your dog died. He's dead. I'm like, I was like, what? I, I, I sort of got, I almost had a heart attack. I, I, I thought this guy was going to scan me. I helped yeah. send him half the money. I was like, oh my fucking God, it's going to help. It turns out the dog ate um, a fork. That's he, weird. Yeah, it's weird. The dog ate a fork. And he just, you know, fucking kill him. <laughs> wow. That's <laughs> bizarre. Yeah. So, well, at the end, the guy had to send me a different dog than the one I, I wanted, but the one that he was going to send me was not even born yet. I had to wait for the dog to be born and all that because um, the the, the five thousand dollars dog that I originally wanted was a stud. It was, it was a grown up dog, so I already had like customers waiting for this you know stud dog to come here to uh, to start breeding and stuff like that, and that kind of messed up all of my plans. You because may have dodged, gonna... dodged the bullet because your stud dog was out there eating forks. I don't know how much, uh, <laughs> how valuable those puppies were going to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that might not have um, ended as well. So I ended up getting the puppy at the end. He just sent it to me. So yeah, a lot of things happened. And then because of this misstep with the dog that instead of getting the grown up dog, I ended up getting a puppy that needed to be, you know, fully grown up and then get to, to competitions to get the titles and all the stuff that I needed to become a, a dog breeder. I actually um, had a lot of missteps in that. And then I, I, I started thinking, you know what, um, why I don't start. How, just, how long, you know, how long had you been playing cards at this point? Like you're going to university all this time. Like how old are you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm 20, 23, maybe. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm maybe 22, 23 years old. That this is probably 2009. Yeah, this is probably 2009, towards the end of 2009, something like that. And I'm trying to, so I'm trying to become a, a you know, the best bull terriers breeder in Costa Rica. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to deal with uh, college, uh, 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 studying physics. And I'm also um, just hustling, trying to, you know, uh, playing some poker uh, back and forth. And then, um, after all of this with the dogs happened, uh, I figured, you know, um, I did, that's back. That's when I got the 
the, the job at the call center. And towards, I don't know, um, the end of 2010, yeah, I, I won $2,000 in a tournament. And I also had like a credit card with another, I don't know, another two or three thousand dollars. And I decided to quit my job and and try to become a professional poker player. Of course, that didn't work out well. Um what happened? I, Just um I busted my bankroll because it wasn't enough. Like, you know, you're you're trying to become a professional poker player and my full bankroll was two thousand dollars plus no, maybe two thousand from a, a credit card. And I also had to pay for my tuition. I had to pay for my, you know, my, uh, my, so you're, bills, trying my to do, you're trying to do it all at the same time. Exactly. You're super stupid. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to be a dog breeder or doing everything at once. So did your mom, um, your mom, that you were, you were just gone. Once you were out, you were out. Did, did she yeah. ever invite you back home or? No, I'm uh, very, what's the word uh, for this in English? Um, I don't know, stubborn or like, um, yeah, maybe my ego wouldn't let me just, you know, go and, talk to her because I was very mad. So I'll, I waited maybe a year, two years before I, I talked to her back again. Wow. Um, you I, didn't even talk to her for two years. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very bad. You know, my, my temper was terrible. That's also why I didn't make it as a poker player because my temper, man, it was crazy. Mental game really was a, ch- a game changer for me. So by the way, have, Michael, I, just yeah. to have, have some self-compassion for that earlier version of yourself I think the problem is you're too smart. You're too smart at an early age, which gives you this hubris to where you think you know way more than you actually know. Like you just have this like early version arrogance of yourself where like you're arrogance. smart yeah. and you get feedback that says you're smart. And then you're like, yeah, I know all this shit about life and navigating emotions and dealing with relationships. <laughs> like I'm already an expert, right? Like at least. <laughs> I could be projecting because this is exactly how I was at 20 years old as well. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I can totally relate. So, um, yeah, uh, that's exactly how I felt. You know, when I was in high school and, and even at uh, university, I didn't ever, okay, maybe high school, I ever, never, ever studied for a test in my life. Same. Uh, yeah, so uh, I actually had like the worst grades in terms of assistance. And your homework, I never did anything like homework, assistance, nothing. I will just get a couple, you know, A's in, in, the, in the test and just had a, you know, um, a, a B overall score or, you know, 80% score where, uh, you know, I lost all the points that were everything that was in the test. So I was used to like going, doing my minimum effort my entire life. And I was rewarded because I was still doing better than average. So that, uh, you know, made made me cocky and arrogant. And also, uh, yeah, I I was very well, very badly uh, used to winning or doing well without actually putting the effort. Later later in life, I learned that uh, in the real world, uh, there, you know, you might be, you might feel like you're a, a big fish in a small, you know, small tank, but when you get to the real world, there are so many people who are like way, way smarter than you are, who probably are more prepared and all of them want the same things in life that you want. So if you don't really push yourself and, you know, you really try your best, you're never going to, you know, get anything real happening to you. And that was, was actually a, a, a tough question that I had to ask myself at some, at some point a couple of times during my life about poker. Um, so getting to the point where I decided to quit college and, and, and become a professional poker player. So I had been trying to do all of those things, you know, the, the dogs, uh, different jobs and, uh, the business of trying to sell, you know, these, uh, black market CDs or DVDs in, in the malls and all of these things and playing poker and also dealing with, you know, uh, college, university. So I had to decide at some point, okay, Michael, what is it? What do you want to do? You want to just, you know, fully 100% commit to the dogs, 100 full percent, you know, commit to to poker, to, you know, becoming an astronaut. What is it? Because at some illegal point, empire of black market exactly, goods. Black market. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I, I was trying to do everything and nothing was completely working. Yeah. You know? So I wasn't doing well in any area. So. I also had this girlfriend. She had been 
uh, we had been uh, together for uh, a lifetime, like six years. That, that, that same girlfriend, right? Yep. So we have been together now for six years, maybe five years, a lot of time. And yeah, so this was in 2011. Yeah, 2011. And I had to ask myself, so what is it? What is it going to be? Um, and then I decided to just completely change my life and, and dedicate to and, and try to, po- to do poker. But I didn't know how to do it. So I, I again failed, but I'll get into it. So I decided to, okay, quit college. I uh, ended my relationship with this girlfriend. I um, moved, moved back uh, to my mother's place. We were already uh, getting uh, together, uh, getting well, uh, uh, getting along well now, but by, by then. So I ended my relationship. I uh, got rid of all of the dogs. I already had already stopped doing the DVDs and stuff. And I, um, I tried to become a poker player. So I started committing to go to the casinos, all of these things. But um, that the casino life is is tougher. I was like maybe yeah, this is 2010, so I was 23, and I wasn't prepared to you know go to a casino, maybe winning two thousand dollars in a night. Then I will go party and just spend all of that money, you know, with girls and having parties. And so I had I, I got into a very self destructive path because I was not I didn't have any commitments. Uh, Suddenly, I had money. I was doing okay playing poker. Um, didn't have a girlfriend for the first time in like five or six years. I don't know. I was living alone, and I was, you know, making okay money playing poker at casinos. Just, you know. Uh, you, you, just to clarify, you you said you were living with your mom, but were yeah, you living alone? Yeah. Uh, just uh, there was this apartment that was um, okay. So my mother's uh, property was a, a bit big. So there were multiple houses. Okay. Now, okay. yeah. So I was, uh, I moved to one of the, this small apartment uh, that was beside my mother's place. It was not, um, it was not nice. It was like a very small wooden, you know, uh, place, just um, one bedroom, you know, restroom. It was, no, it was no not crackheads outside though. So no, exactly. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a good part. No crackheads outside, but yeah, uh, but it was, it was a uh, humble, a humble place. But I was, I was, at least I was on my own. I started with uh, doing okay money. And, but the, the, the thing is that I never got to build a bankroll because perhaps my bankroll was, I don't know, 5000 to $10,000. I don't know. And I will maybe win one, 2K one night. If I win 2K, I will spend the night 2K, you know? So I was kind of, you know, um, any money that I was making, I will spend it right away having, you know, parties or doing stupid shit. Or um, I will also tilt a shit ton and then give back a lot of that money playing poker. So I will have a lot of, I, I will have huge swings. So if my bankroll was 10K, I will have maybe 3K swings, which is crazy. You know, how can I lose $3,000 in a night, you know, if my bankroll is 10K and then try to get it back the next day and back and forth and doing that for months and, you know, so much, a, a lot of times. So, John, I wanted to ask you why you decided to invest in a preflop boot camp. Everything that you had done with me to that point, or I had heard you do, had impressed me. I loved the podcast. I accidentally ended up in the poker power hour and loved that. And then I took coaching and then you recommended the boot camp. And at first I didn't think it was, you know, something that would be that valuable. But I was like, everything else has been amazing. So I signed up and then it just blew me away. And what about boot camp blew you away? Like it started off slow. Like I'm learning these ranges and I'm not even understanding what you're talking about. And then all of a sudden, as I start to understand what we're doing with the three bets, the four bets, all of a sudden it just kind of hit me. And I was like, oh my God, how do I not know this stuff? This is amazing. The more I studied them, I started to understand why they were constructed sometimes. Like, I'd be like, that's why that's like that. And that would lead to more revelations and just a better understanding of poker in general. Do you have any interesting takeaways from your boot camp experience? 
The most interesting thing about the boot camp, it's a pre-flop boot camp, but I feel like it's done as much for my post game as it did for my pre-game, just because I'm not in as many awkward and bad situations as I found myself in. You know, when we were doing coaching before the boot camp, we couldn't get through 10, 15 minutes of tape without finding mistake after mistake. And then once we did the boot camp, it solved problems on the back end as well. I know you've studied for a thousand hours this year. How do you think boot camp compares to your other poker study? Oh, it's crazy. The boot camp is probably the most important thing I've done all year out of everything. I would give anything to go back and to, to know that stuff 10 years ago. I can't imagine how successful I'd be right now if I had known that stuff. And I thought the boot camp was so valuable that I literally insisted you take more money from me and paid you more for the boot camp because I was blown away. I just thought the price was too cheap. And it's changed my game in ways that I, I can't even explain to you. If you'd like to join the next round of Preflop Bootcamp, which starts on the last Saturday of every month, head to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp to lock up your spot. One more time, that's ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp. Going back to the mental side of it, I do kind of see this cycle and just being you know, immersed in your story right now, looking back on it, like, do you think how how much of this was self-sabotage? Especially, especially related to, you know, your mom's feeling of poker and being so adamantly against it. I I think that like, was there the thought somewhere in the back of your mind that maybe you didn't deserve the money that you were making, that winning 3K Mm. in a night, that it didn't feel good in the same way that maybe selling dogs would have felt to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think actually that um, that's something that uh, was probably happening and happened for a long time. Uh, me self-sabotaging myself for sure, feeling like um, I wasn't probably worthy or, or anything like that. And I think that, hap- that kept happening for many years until I got to develop truly self-esteem and appreciation for what, what I was doing. And yeah, so maybe, I don't know, it, it was a, a, a mix and a conflict here, an internal conflict for me because I always felt like self-entitled to a lot of things. I felt like, you know, I was this huge genius who deserved everything. But at the same time, I wasn't successful. At the, at the same time, I wasn't making my mother proud. And she, um, well, she was a single mother and she raised all of my, uh, you know, me and my three brothers by herself. Then later, uh, uh, the father jumped in the mixer, but uh, for the most part, she did everything on, on, her, on, her, on her own. And she kind of gave up on her dreams, you know, to raise all of us. And so I remember her being so um, strict and she will like get up at, I don't know, 5 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m., uh, get all of us ready to go to high school, uh, you know, cook all of the stuff. Then she will go to her her job. Then uh, at the end, at night, she will come back, you know, do all of the stuff over again. And then she will stay late studying, you know, just trying to finish her degree so she could move on, you know. But the thing is that she couldn't, like, like made all of her dreams come true. And so her dream was kind of built... Uh, or push towards me where she she wanted to she wanted me so badly to succeed and to be this astronaut or you know this um this shining star for her and so that that's a lot of way to put in a teenager you know and when a kid i see and it I, I see it so cl- i see it much more clearly now i'm able to express my thoughts better than i was a few minutes ago i see the same again i could be projecting but i never studied in high school either I also had people telling me that I was super smart and special, and I thought of myself as super smart. It's only in adult life that I realized, looking back, that I never applied myself because I was afraid. I was afraid that if I did, I would not be good enough. I would find out that I was not actually special, that it was all a lie, and that my world would come crashing down, right? 
And I think that in poker, especially you're hearing your story, if you apply yourself, if you build a bankroll, if you give it a proper shot, your biggest fear is that you're not good enough to make it. And when you lose $3,000 out of a $10,000 bankroll, you blow it on girls or in the club, you always give yourself that out that said, yeah. well, I could have made it, but I spent yeah. that 3K, right? Yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I could have, if, if, uh, if that's the thing. I just thinking, well, if I really, you know, push myself, I would have made it, but I never did that. So, yeah. And you always had that out. Yeah. Yep, you always have that out. That's, that's like the, the core of self-sabotage, right? You're like, well, mm. your, your greatest fear is that you're not good enough to make it. And so to never realize that reality, you never give it a chance by always putting yeah, you yourself know, in a you, bad you know position. What? Uh, my father, he was like the biggest loser ever, you know? My grandmother hated him, hated his guts. <laughs> and um, my mother kicked him away when I was like nine years old, I think, because he was like this hustler who never got anything go- going for himself. He was trying to, you know, always have like this big idea for a business or something. At the end, he just left my mother with a bunch of debt and, you know, uh, three kids and a lot of debt. So, you know, I maybe it was just fear of becoming my father, you know, just being this big loser because my father, he was also like very smart. He just, he quit high school and no, he actually, he, he quit college. Uh, to, he was going to become an electric engineer and he quit that uh, to become a sales agent and then marry my mother. And so then he just, he just messed up everything. And it was probably this fear of becoming my father that um yeah and, and also disappoint my mother at the same time and all of this you know pressure that had me into this path of you know self-destructive path and it, it got me for years where I was trying to you know to make it as a poker player but I wasn't really trying to make it as a poker player I was just playing cards and having you know uh, a lot of destructive behaviors with uh you know um, alcohol drugs girls partying around and you know making money then blasting it all again um this path lasted for years after uh until i suddenly uh well after, that was after i quit um college and yeah this this behavior lasted for, for quite a while maybe after it was from 2010 to 2013 and the last time what i um the, the final shot that i gave myself as a professional you know, maker was the third time that i got i went bankrupt I was able to build a bank of $30,000, which is a big deal here in Costa Rica. And then I was stupid enough to lend half of my money to my best friend back then. And I got in the dance swing and lost, uh, you know, the other 15K. Suddenly I find myself, I was paying for an apartment now. I was living, you know, in a different place, having a nicer life because I was making good money. I had $30,000 at some point. So I had this apartment. Uh, I wasn't living in the wooden house anymore. And suddenly uh, my rent was $700 and my bank was $2,000. And that's all I had in my, in, you know, on me. And so I had to make a, a decision there. I had to make a decision. I had to choose to go back to my day job, uh, my last job. I, I, I worked there for a year or so um, in finance. And I was doing okay. My my salary was between fifteen hundred to seventeen hundred dollars. So for Costa Rica, that's that's good. I could have gone back there to that job, or go back to my mother's house, the wooden house, you know, the apartment next to hers, and try the micro stakes online. Apply for a poker stable, and again, have to listen to my mother. You know, just going and 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 tell her, you know, I fail again, and I want to try this poker thing again. And I just blasted all of my money again. And I need your help. I need to go back to, you know, to, to your place. It was, it was a hard, you know, hard thing to do, very hard thing to do at that point for me. But I had to, you know, swallow my pride and do that or just forget about poker and tell myself, okay, Michael, what is it? Is, is it just an excuse that you've never applied yourself, that you've never really tried your best? Or is it just something that you tell yourself because you're just not good enough? Because this is the fucking third time that you're fucking up, man. This is the third time you're, you know, blasting your money. At that, t- at, at that point, I was 28 years old now. 
So 27, no, 27 or 28, yeah, something like that. So I was, I was already approaching the 30s and I had been wasting my life, all of my 20s, trying to make it and trying to do stupid shit, like, you know, dogs, uh, DVDs, whatever. And I just, I quit high school, I quit the college. I didn't make it there either. So I- Just, uh, really, just kind of like a bag yeah. blowing in the wind. Exactly. All directions. So, yeah. So I had to ask myself, okay, Michael, what is it? Are you just a loser and you just, you know, keep putting excuses to yourself? So I had tried to apply to an a, a online stable. I applied to all of them, actually. And I only got, I only heard back from polcar.com. You've heard me talk early and often about how improving your awareness while you're playing cards so that you make better decisions in the moment and notice trouble spots that merit deeper consideration is one of the most valuable things you can do to make more money on the felt. In my conversation with the only four-time WPT main event champion ever, Darren Elias, he told me that his ability to shut out all of the distractions in the world and fully focus on making great decision after great decision is his superpower he most attributes to his success. And you cannot improve your awareness at the tables without being fully present. When you learn how to stay fully in the moment on the green felt, you can finally have a clear path to becoming the absolute best version of yourself, which leads me to Jason Sue. Jason is one of the foremost authorities on the planet when it comes to playing poker with presence. As a matter of fact, he even wrote the book on it. Here's a direct quote from Nick Howard at Poker Detox on Jason's ability to help you stay focused. Quote, Jason's work is a new paradigm in poker and performance. End quote. And these aren't just empty words. Nick has put his money where his mouth is by hiring Jason to coach up the Poker Detox crew. And as a loyal listener of Chasing Poker Greatness, you know by now that I would not be promoting anything I didn't 100% believe would improve your poker skills and your life. So if you want to master your emotions and perform at your peak with presence while doing battle in the arena, You'd be doing yourself a grave disservice if you didn't check out Jason's work at PokerWithPresence.com. One final time, that's PokerWithPresence.com. When you went to your mom, yeah, how did she respond? I knew it. She was like, I knew it. I knew this was going to happen again. Oh. Yeah, she's like, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, of course. Never showing support. Like, yeah, of course, come on. You know, I will help you out. Anything like that. It was 100% all disappointment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so not fun. Not, <laughs> not, a, fun. not a fun not, conversation. Not, not, not at all. Not at yeah. all. So I had to use this $2,000 that I had left to at least, you know, pay for my stuff because I wasn't going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't going to be a uh, uh, burden for her. So at least I was going to pay my bills and my food and my stuff. And I just needed shelter, right? And I had a laptop and I figured, okay, I can play online, Michael. So I applied to uh, the stables online and I only heard back from poker. I haven't really, I hadn't really played that much uh, online poker. I had uh, part of the $30,000 bank that I built uh, had happened in, in, in the previous year. I won $10,000 playing in $11 driven in poker stars. So they asked me to send them that hand history. And then they replied to the email selling, saying that I just had too many leaks in my game that, uh, that I need to work on them and maybe reapply. So I actually... How did that feel? Horribly because, yeah, I, I, I realized that I wasn't, you know, need as good as I thought I was because it's a different thing to go to a casino and play against, you know, drunk uh, tourists, people who have no clue of what they're doing and feeling like, yeah, you're the greatest because you beat these guys who have no clue of what they're doing. But when you're playing online against, you know, all the regulars or the professional players and they, you know, just shows how, how bad you really are and how lucky I was to win those, those $10,000. I didn't win this, those $10,000 because I was the best. I was just lucky. And that, that's a reality that I had to face. So I was just lucky. So... I replied to Alex Carr and I told him, you know what? I know I'm bad. Uh, here is another hand history of a tournament that I think I play uh, probably better in this one. I was really focused. And all I want is a chance. All I need is a shot to get trained by you. I, all I want is the coaching. If you can put me, I don't, I don't care, you know, the lowest stakes, stakes possible you can put me in. 
but I only needed the chance to prove myself. I'm a smart guy. I can learn. So if you give me the shot, I promise you that I'll give it my 100%. So he replied to me and they, uh, they offered me a stake to play $5, uh, $10, and $13 tournaments uh, in, you know, online. And that, that was the, the start with them. And they offered the coaching. They had this amazing video library with, uh, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of videos. I remember I, I watched over 200 videos. I ate every single article I could find online and I started working really hard on my game. What, what was then, it like to realize like the gap, the skill gap from like where you thought you were at to where these guys were at and where you really needed to be? Oh man, it, it was, it was huge. You know, um, one of my favorite, uh, phrases from all time is from, from this philosopher, uh, Damn it. Okay, so there is Plato and there is um, Socrates. Socrates, yeah, Socrates. So Socrates, he said, uh, "All I know is that I know nothing, or something like that." I don't know the exact words in English. So I think the more you learn about any topic, the more you learn, you realize just how much you are missing, how much you know. You, That's you the other learn. side. That's the other side of arrogance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'll become humble to to know that you know you really know shit. You know, it's, you know, these guys are so good. They are so knowledgeable. And so all I had left to do was to just, you know, push myself to, to learn and to do better and start outworking people because now I was like, I don't know, 28 years old. And I had to compete with all of these guys who were, you know, in their early 20s, whose minds are probably faster than mine now because, you know, they're just younger. And who are also maybe even smarter than I was, and they were already working on their games. Or some guys who were like maybe, you know, 24, 25, and they had been working on their games for six years. And, you know, guys like Abe Styles, uh, who had been around for like, I don't know, 12 years before me, and he's been working his game ever since he got started. And I, I, oh, me, because of my arrogance, I wasted all of my 20s doing a stupid shit. And, you know, so I had to really, really push myself it's like if I wanted to you know, get to a point where I was like world-class or at least good, you know, to start winning. And yeah, so yeah, to finish the story, um, I really, really pushed myself hard. I devoted myself. I was um, one of the fastest moving guys moving up in stakes in the poker stable. I went from, you know, the micros all the way up to the high stakes in I think a year time frame, And then... I even became, yeah, I became a coach for them. I started coaching for them. Uh, what I, uh, led to the breakthrough? Just, what was the uh, breakthrough? Yeah, just, you know, be, becoming humble enough to ask them for an opportunity and realizing that, you know, this is it, Michael. If, if you mess this one up, this is it. Uh, you're going back to your day job. So you need to, you, you always tell yourself this excuse that you are, have failed and you have consistently been failing because you don't push yourself so for one fucking life, uh, one fucking time in your life, just push yourself, give it your hundred percent, your hundred ten percent, and see where can this lead you. And well, uh, that was in mid two thousand fourteen that I joined poker. Uh, yeah, mid two thousand fourteen. So it's been six years. And well, my book was published one year ago. So in five years time frame. I was able to go from knowing nothing about the game, being a complete wreck in my life, to writing the most advanced game theory poker book in the world. And, you know, that's crazy how you can really turn your life around if you, if you really want to apply yourself. It's not about being smart. It's not about being talented. It's about, you know, pushing yourself and really wanting it so bad that you're willing to do what it takes. And unburdening yourself of that fear and just venturing into the unknown with the expectation you might find out something about yourself that you don't like but mm -hmm. you might also find out something about yourself that you love at the same time but there's only one way to find it out for sure and that's to it. give it yeah. 100 percent right give it all exactly don't be afraid of losing or failing and that is if there's something that i've learned from poker Man, is that you, you need to be, you need to get used to failing and losing because otherwise you're just gonna, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna fail. Uh, you're gonna miserably fail because failing is not only just, um, failing is when you quit. Failing is when you are not pushing yourself. Failing is not making a mistake or, or not getting there. 
And so something that really, really helped me maybe uh, later in, uh, when I started, because first it was learning the technical skills and becoming proficient at the game, but then the mental game. I have a lot to thank to Dr. Trisha Carner and Elliot Rowe because, um, you know, they, their mentorship and also, you know, Alex Carr, seeing him and Abe Stiles, all of these guys who have been around forever helped me, you know, also get a lot of that burden, yeah, from myself and be like, you know what, it's okay if I fail. At least I will know that I gave it, I gave it my all. And if this doesn't work, there's going to be something that's going to work for me. So don't be afraid anymore. Um, actually, the opposite should be the opposite. Just should be excited that you have the opportunity to give it your all and maybe become successful at playing a game and, you know, make a life playing a cards game. That's amazing. I, I want this, this whole story. It, I mean, it's, a, it's an awesome, powerful story. I want to tie it together at the end with your relationship with your mom today. What does that look like? Man, it's amazing. Now she's my number one fan. <laughs> you know, uh, what does nearly, it mean to you? What does it mean to you to say those words? She's my number one fan. It means world, actually. Um, you know, I have been playing online uh, for maybe, I don't know, nine months or 10 months. I was living in that, you know, uh, wooden house next to her. And one day, um, she she went over there to you know, just uh, get me some food, and I was playing this twenty two dollars tournament and poker stars. Uh, I was deep in the tournament; it was my last tournament, and so she sat down and and she started you know just watching me play, and I started talking to him to her and explaining to her you know this is how it works. So I get dealt two cards; you can see them here, and you know this is what happens. So I started I started explaining to her how the the game worked. And when I was explain, explaining to her, I was playing and I get to the final table and I, um, I win this tournament for, I think it was $2,000 or something. And she, while she was watching me, I finished first and it felt so, so, so great. Um, then later, um, uh, she even downloaded Poker Stars. She made a username and she will, every time I play, she will always log in and just, you know, pull off my tables and wow. watch me play. Yeah. So even before I started streaming or anything like that, she's been watching me play um, for years now. And sometimes, you know, when I get deep in a tournament or something, she will message me and say like, oh, uh, that was so lucky. How can you lose that hand? Or, you know, <laughs> something like that. And it's crazy because she learned the game um, and she became so supportive. And now she, yeah, she loved what I do. And after... Uh, you know, I, I was successful at, you know, writing this book and the book has done so well. And, you know, she, she doesn't have to tell, um, I don't know, uh, her, her, um, her family or, or friends or whatever that, uh, you know, um, her, her, um, her kid is like a national or something like that. She's just proud to tell, you know, to tell people that I'm a poker player and, and, you know, she, she loves it. So that's, that's great. Yeah, that's, man, that, that is actually a, a super powerful way to end this conversation. And this is most definitely going to be round one because I only asked one question. Um, <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can definitely do more than this. I mean, I'm, I'm down for it. Uh, I yeah. love, you know. Me too. I love, I mean, look, uh, I'm, I was totally drawn in. This is an amazing story. And I'm the listener will absolutely love every second of it. And the listener will just have to wait for the round two, where we ask you know, maybe, maybe two questions next time. If, we can, <laughs> uh, if we're lucky, right. But I know that you're, you're a busy guy. You have a webinar that you're preparing for at pokercoaching.com. And so get to that and we'll do a round two in the very, very near future, man. It, it's been really uh, pleasure speaking with you and, and getting to know you. This has uh, really been awesome for me. Thank you so much for having me, Brad. I really appreciate it, man. Uh, you know, I, it's, it's funny. It's interesting because, you know, nobody, nobody ever asked me these type of questions before. So it's, it's good to have the opportunity to talk about these things because I figure there might be probably a lot of people out there who have the same or similar issues to the ones that I had, you know, 
I think um, maybe if my story can help someone, you know, uh, keep pursuing their dreams and don't quit and uh, really push themselves, uh, you know, there's always something good to, to to be taken away from things like this. So I'm I'm, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to to potentially, you know, have a, a positive impact in somebody else's life. And if somebody wants to contact you, if somebody wants to learn more about you on the internet, where can they go? Uh, best way is to just contact me on social media. You can find me at GTO Poker, pretty much anywhere, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter. Awesome, man. And by the way, the reason that I'm so apt to discuss the, the journey and the story side is because... I've discussed way too much poker strategy in my life and it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not the most interesting thing to me anymore. Right? Like I want to know, <laughs> I want to know where guys come from, the things that stood in their path and just all the, all the things that they've had to, to navigate. That's always been the most important, or the most interesting part of the poker journey to me, even more so than like the technical learning side. Yeah. Thank you so much for asking these questions, man. And, and you know, for driving the conversation this way is, is cool. I also, of course, love and you know discussing theory or you know strategy, but that's the main thing that I typically do. So, doing having the opportunity to do something different like this has been amazing. So, thank you very, very much for this. Next time, we're going to go deep into theory and strategy. Promise, <laughs> promise, promise you, listeners. Till next time. <laughs> All right, man. Cheers. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker and Greatness. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.